The groups form large, sombre structures and they're set, for once, in a legible architectural space. That dark arch of the prison wall repeats the curve of the group below it and is balanced by the yawning rectangle of the window. The Baptist is almost any victim professionally killed on the bare stone of a prison yard. Caravaggio's signature is traced in his blood. It is the most Shakespearean of all his paintings, and there's a line uttered by Richard II that might be its epigraph. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. The Grand Master de Vignacourt rewarded him for it with, among other things, a gold collar and two slaves. But then Caravaggio's luck slipped. He fought with one of the Maltese knights and was clapped in prison. And in the meantime, the knights began to wake up to why Caravaggio had really fled from Rome. And they set up a criminal commission to investigate him. Caravaggio guessed what would happen and he managed to escape from the fortress at Valletta. He got on board a felucca and fled to Syracuse in Sicily and the knights formally expelled him as a corrupt and foul member of their order and de Vignacor, who was outraged, sent a pair of assassins after Caravaggio to finish him off or bring him back. Caravaggio didn't feel safe in Sicily and he was right. He wasn't safe anywhere. He stayed a while in Syracuse and visited a famous cave near the city, which, according to local legend, was an antique prison built by Dionysius. It's an interesting footnote to Caravaggio's paranoid frame of mind that he concluded the place had been made in the shape of an ear so that jailers could hear every word the prisoners said. And ever since Caravaggio's visit, it has been called the Ear of Dionysius. But the last act had begun. A panicky flight round southern Italy, chased by the Grand Master's hounds, doing paintings on the run. No artist probably has ever worked under more pressure. Yet Caravaggio has one extraordinary image left in him. In Messina, in 1609, he paints the resurrection of Lazarus. Of all his paintings, this one is closest to the spirit of Masaccio. It's as if he'd gone back to the beginning. The cemetery wall has become a tall, greyish-brown void that rises above the frieze of figures, and more than half the painting actually is empty. Caravaggio has returned to the pointing Christ of the St Matthew cycle, but now the movement of his arm and the folds of his toga have acquired a stupendous, archaic authority. The talking heads behind him might have been lifted from Masaccio's frescoes in the Brancacci Chapel. And Lazarus himself is like a marble warrior coming to life, the legs rigid, but the arms flushed and thrust out with vitality. That group, with Lazarus' sister bending over his face and trying to breathe life into him, is as compressed and as concentrated as any Roman bas-relief. For him, classicism was not a dead hand. It was an inheritance that had to be reinvented in the presence of nature. And that's what made him so foreign to the Mannerists and so great and stimulating an artist. The resurrection of Lazarus shows once again that he had no wish to abandon the past, but he did want to make it the receptacle of the most concrete experience and the most exalted feeling. And perhaps more than any other work of his, this one makes you wonder what he might have done if he had lived. He couldn't keep up such a pitch of intensity all the time. Later in 1609, he moved to Palermo and painted this nativity with St. Lawrence and St. Francis. It's a much more conventional painting, less ecstatic, rather more highly finished than Lazarus. The Holy Family in their stable with their attendant saints, the child lying in a kind of protective cocoon of dark drapery and an angel flying down from heaven with a scroll.
But he couldn't stay in Sicily forever. It was a provincial dump, and he was still a Roman success, the most celebrated painter of his generation. And he needed the banishment from Rome revoked. Even more, he needed de Vignacor off his back. So on the 20th of October, 1609, he set off for Naples, and there he painted his last pictures. Two of them were Salome's with the head of John the Baptist, his now obsessive image, and within it, the motif of the old and the young woman conjoined as if growing schizophrenically from the same body. The last was a flagellation, perhaps the most sadistic and despairing picture he had ever produced. Christ's body has none of the ecstatic skinniness of Lazarus. It's sleek, radiant with light and vulnerable. Beside it, the flogger on the left is almost a caricature of evil, a monkey-faced, gap-toothed little runt who clearly loves his job. The one on the right is all brute force. It's more a painting of types than of individuals and it may be partly autobiographical. Outside a thieves' hangout called the Locanda del Cerillo, Caravaggio encountered some thugs, possibly the ones sent by the Knights of Malta. They did him over so thoroughly that he was left unrecognizable, but they did not quite kill him, even though he was reported dead in Rome. Caravaggio must have been badly scared and ill and weak, but he knew that his old friends and patrons were lobbying for the pardon, and he decided to move closer to Rome. He didn't want to go straight into papal territory, and so he found himself a passage to Porto Ercole, north of Rome, and Spanish controlled. He also hoped to get past the Knights of Malta, who presumably knew by now that he was still alive. In July 1610, he landed there. The measure of his fear was that before quitting Naples, he packed his painting of Salome with the head of John the Baptist and sent it off to Malta to placate, he hoped, the implacable Grand Master. And then he got on the felucca and set sail for Porto Ercole, for the shivering ague, and for this grey beach, and for the last interminable darkness. And three days after he died, his pardon finally arrived. <laughs> 